Tonight we're beginning a brand new Bible study series that I'm very excited about. We live in an age where personal freedom seems to be the highest value in our culture, even while our culture continues to slide into bondage. You've probably heard some of these misguided statements. You're not the boss of me. No one has the right to tell me what's right or wrong. It's wrong for you to impose your beliefs on me. You have your value system, and I have mine. That's just your opinion. What's true for you isn't necessarily what's true for me. I can do whatever I want as long as I'm not hurting anyone. When the history of our age is finally written, it will probably be summed up something like this. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And in fact, that expression just happens to be the closing words of the book of Judges in your Bible. So the attitude is not new. It's actually a very old problem with humanity. And that's why we're looking into this particular uh, series of lessons and this particular segment of Scripture. Now, in the Hebrew Bible, which is our Old Testament, the order of the books is slightly different. Uh, we have it one way. The Jewish people have it another way. And in the Hebrew Bible, the book of Ruth is placed much later. It's among what they call the writings. And so 1 and 2 Samuel follow immediately after the book of Judges. So the very last thing you read before you jump into the books of Samuel are these words in Judges. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. First and second Samuel were originally just one book called the book of Samuel. And the story they contain is actually the solution to the problem that's right there in that verse. The book of Samuel starts with no king, a time of moral anarchy and chaos, but it ends with a king. The final chapters of the book of Judges are pretty grim reading. They are not stories you've ever heard in Sunday school. They are grim and ugly and brutal. They're full of all kinds of violence and immorality because that's exactly what life is like when there's no authority and when everyone does what is right in their own eyes and that is exactly like this generation. Now the situation in Samuel is actually a little bit more complicated even than that. It's technically true that Israel had no human king but that was only because they refused to acknowledge God as their king. So the real problem isn't a lack of authority, it's the lack of obedience to authority. That's always the problem. And that is why when Israel does ask for a king in the book of Samuel, we see God regarding their choice and their request as a rejection of him and his rule and his kingdom. As we finally see Saul's disastrous reign in 1 Samuel and David's flawed reign in 2 Samuel, we're left wondering if Israel having a king is actually much more improvement on them not having a king. At best, human kings are a mixed blessing in the nation of Israel. Now, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, one of the early manuscripts that was translated into Greek, 1st and 2nd Samuel are actually called 1st and 2nd Kingdoms, hence the name of, of this Bible study series. As we read through any part of the Old Testament, here's what we need to keep in mind, and I hope you keep this in mind when you come to Bible study. Especially in the Old Testament, we need to remember that we are not just reading history. Rather, what we're doing is we're reading preached history. The writers aren't just creating an historical account. They are teaching us about God and about his reign in our lives, and ultimately, they're pointing to Jesus Christ who is the king of kings, eventually come in flesh. This is what the Bible scholars call typology. 
It's where Old Testament events and persons and ceremonies and statements and even the structure of buildings like the tabernacle, all of those things point ahead to the New Testament, to revelation and to truth. And it's a very rewarding way to study your Bible. Here's a great example from the book of Samuel. Israel's kings were always anointed with oil. So in the Old Testament, when you referred to the king, you referred to him as the anointed one. That title would be translated Messiah in Hebrew. Later, it would be translated Christ in Greek. And so when you look at the disastrous reign of Saul and you look at the flawed reign of David, what this preached history in the books of Samuel is doing is it's pointing us beyond these anointed ones to the anointed one. It's pointing us beyond these men who were Israel's king. And in Hebrew, they would have been called Messiah. In Greek, they would have been called Christ, both meaning the anointed one, because that's how they began their reign. Well, this preached history is pointing us far beyond these human messiahs or Christ. And it's, it's pointing us beyond those people that were imperfect. And it leaves us longing for something. Even Old Testament people long for it. They long for a ruler, a king, a Messiah, a Christ, an anointed one who wasn't imperfect, but he was perfect. And so as we begin our journey tonight through this Bible study series, and by the way, we have no idea right now how long this is going to last. Uh, so we'll figure that out as we go along. I'm just thrilled to be back in these books after a lot of years. Uh, it's been a long time since I've had the privilege of teaching through them. Um, but as you read the Bible on your own, or as we proceed through this Bible study, keep in mind that you should always be on the lookout for preached history, history that teaches a lesson to help you in living for God. And so we begin with 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramalphazim Zophim, how's that for a name, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroah the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. That's a good handle for somebody. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. That's not just a little aside or a little insignificant uh, detail. The name of Elkanah's first wife, Hannah, means favored, but yet she's barren. And the name of his other wife, his second wife, Penina, to make matters worse, her name means fruitful. And true to her name, she has many children. And that makes life very difficult for Hannah. You see, it's different than just being barren, which would be difficult. Uh, in the Old Testament, God had promised a savior to Adam in Genesis 3. And then he promised Abraham in Genesis 22 that his offspring would bless the entire world. So every birth in Israel raised a question, is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the one? So if a lady was barren, it wasn't just a personal tragedy like it is today. It carried a sense of her being totally excluded from the promises of God. And verse 3 tells us that this man, Elkanah, he went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. We'll come back to them later in a later lesson because they figure uh, in an important way in Samuel's story. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and daughters portions. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion or a generous portion for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Now, Elkanah is being scrupulously uh, ethical and fair here. Uh, the people of Israel used to go to Shiloh to worship. Jerusalem is far in the distance. It won't be their capital for several decades but when they go up to where the tabernacle is situated in Shiloh, they leave their home in Ramah and they go to Shiloh. Um, they eat a meal of celebration before the Lord. It always happened. Deuteronomy 12 verse 7 tells us about that. And each person eating that meal, that celebration meal, they're given one portion of food or meat or whatever is served. And although Elkanah is being as generous as he can with his beloved Hannah, even a generous portion can't compensate for the many portions 
he gives to Panina and her children. She has many children. So it's fair, but every time it happens, it accentuates Hannah's barrenness. And she simply does not understand why the Lord had shut up her womb. Now, that would be bad enough, but then we read these words. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, whenever she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. And therefore, because Panina kept uh, teasing and mocking and just being arrogant with Hannah, Hannah wept sore and she did not eat. And then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? Which all goes to show that men don't understand women at all. There's no good answer to any one of those questions. But you can feel the heartbreak in the verses. Because Elkanah doesn't know what to do. And Hannah is vexed and perplexed and grieved. And Panina is kind of the little snide, arrogant victor so far in this story. See, every time Hannah goes to worship, it's just a reminder that her prayer hasn't been answered. Every time she goes to worship, she has to think about the barrenness in her life. But it's even worse than that. Every time she goes to worship... Her emotions get the best of her, and she weeps so much that she can't even partake of the portion from the Lord she has been given. Every time she goes to worship, she has to deal with the pity and the questions from her well-meaning husband and even some of her friends. But worst of all, every time Hannah goes to worship, she has to face the taunting of her adversary, Panina, who never wastes an opportunity to provoke Hannah and remind her of everything that is lacking in her life. And I would pause in the middle of this Old Testament story, which is preached history, and say, I think there might be an application to us today, because some of you have probably felt that way sometime when you came to church, like the enemy was attacking, and your emotions were in a turmoil, and you had a whole lot more questions than you had answers for, and that was Hannah's life. It was very disturbing to her. And sometimes we come to church and the situations and the circumstances of life, they mess us up so badly that even when we come into the house of God, it's hard to concentrate on why we're here and what the Lord would like to do and has done and has promised in our lives. Can I get a little bit of a witness there? Anybody ever felt that way? Well, the best way to overcome that is to do what Hannah is about to do, and that is to look your enemy and all your questioners and all the people that may doubt or have some kind of opinion and even look yourself straight in the face in a mirror sometime and say, no matter what happens or no matter what has happened or no matter what I fear might happen, I am going to go to church and I'm going to do my best to ignore everything else and I am going to get myself into the presence of God and I am going to pray and I am going to worship as though I just came down from cloud nine on top of the mountain because my circumstances do not control me. My adversary certainly doesn't control me and no other human being controls me. So when I go to church, I'm going to do my best to push pause on all of the above and I'm just going to reach out and I'm going to worship God in spite of it, even if I can't worship God because of it. And if you feel anything like that, I wish you'd lift up your hands right now in the presence of God because he is here and we are at Bible study tonight. And I wish you'd lift up your hands and give God praise. And it really doesn't matter what kind of week you've had. And it really doesn't matter who your adversary is. And it really doesn't matter that you have unanswered questions. That really doesn't matter because Jesus is here and the right response in the presence of God is to go to prayer and go to worship. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. I love you, Jesus. And we've all been there, by the way. 
You may think, well, I don't know if anybody else has ever felt the way I feel. I guarantee you there are people in this room that have had your circumstance, they've had your setback, they've had your heartbreak, and you may not have heard about it yet, but someday you will, and you'll realize that your problem, it may have your name on it, but it's not unique. There's no temptation taken us, but such as is common to man. I thank God there's an end to that verse, but God is faithful, and he won't suffer for us to be tempted above that which we're able to bear. And so that's what Hannah did. Despite all her heartache and despite this adversary, Penina, who tormented and tortured her all the time, one year after they had eaten, Hannah rose up in Shiloh after they had eaten and drunk and they'd had all the portions that were theirs. And she still felt left out and she still felt lonely and she still felt forsaken. She rose up and she went to pray. The Bible says, Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and if you'll just remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but if you'll give unto thine handmaid a man child. God, if you'll answer this prayer, here's what I'm gonna do. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now, for Elkanah, Hannah's bitterness is a reason to pity her. And for Penina, it's a reason to mock her. But for Hannah... Her barrenness is a reason for her to go to prayer. So she leaves her family and she leaves the feast and she goes to the tabernacle in Shiloh to talk to the Lord. And it was here that the aged high priest Eli, he sat on a seat to oversee all the ministry of the tabernacle there in Shiloh. Now she has no idea and he has no idea, no one has any idea that the entire future of Israel is about to be decided by the prayer that this one little barren lady is about to pray in the middle of her suffering and her torment and her frustration and her loneliness and her disappointment. And I would say to you, you never know what prayer accomplishes. You think you have to be feeling like a million dollars and be on the mountaintop to pray an effective prayer, not so. Hannah prayed a prayer that literally shifted the trajectory of all of Israel and really all of human history and she was in the middle of the worst trial of her life. So I don't know who you are tonight. I, I don't know what your situation is, uh, but I can tell you this, that you never know when prayer is going to reach up and touch God's throne and change everything. And you, here's the thing. You might not feel anything when you pray that prayer. You might not have an immediate confirmation when you pray that prayer. You might not have some emotional supercharge when you pray that prayer, and nobody else might notice or give you a word from God when you pray that prayer. But don't don't you dare stop praying because prayer literally moves the hand of God. Hannah makes a vow to the Lord that if he will give her a son, she'll give him back to be a lifelong Nazarite. No razor will come upon his head. That's in, in keeping with Numbers chapter 6. It was a mark of humiliation and dedication of those people. And, and so she gives him back to the Lord in a very physical sense. God, if you'll give me this son... He'll be yours all the days of his life. So she's not asking for a blessing as much as she's asking to be a blessing to God's kingdom. She is not trying to manipulate God just to get what she wants. She is magnifying God's sovereignty in her life and in her future. And the Bible says, and it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. He was watching her praying. Now, Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. And so this, uh, this tottering old high priest named Eli, he walks over to Hannah just near the tabernacle in Shiloh, and he says, in probably a very disgusted tone of voice, 
How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answers, probably with tears running down her face, and she says, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid to be a daughter of Belial. Don't, don't think I'm of the devil. For out of the abundance of my complaint and my grief, I have spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Okay, now I understand. Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Now here's what you've got to understand. Hannah's prayer was so intense that Eli thought she was drunk. Some people think prayer and worship and praise are about quiet contemplation. And sometimes you'll even get somebody to imply that the more mature you are, the more calm you are. Nothing could be further from the truth. Hannah doesn't even have the New Testament experience of the Holy Ghost, but she does have a pure passion in prayer that puts some New Testament believers to absolute shame. If a little Old Testament lady without the knowledge of Jesus Christ, without being baptized in Jesus' name and never having had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, if she could pray so intensely that somebody thought she was drunk, I'm here to tell you that every once in a while we should just forget about ourselves and we should reach out after God in ways that maybe people think we're a little strange. I don't mind it when people come in and think we're strange for worshiping. I mind it when people come in and think, well, that church has just got a different doctrine, but they're very much like any other church I've ever been to in the city of Fredericton. Now that bothers me because church in general is a dead horse. Church in general is a dying art, but when it comes to the apostolic church, surely there should be as much passion in us for praise and prayer and worship as there is in a little lady in the Old Testament who's just grieving that over the fact she doesn't have a son. So if you would just kind of stir it up on a Bible study night, it would really make pastor happy. But more than that, it would please God and it would scare the devil because he wouldn't be expecting it. I wish you'd lift up your voice and just give God just a burst of praise, just a burst of worship, just a, a burst of prayer because God is worthy and he's always listening and he's always ready to receive your praise. Now that right there, that sets the apostolics apart from everybody else. That sets the apostolics apart from religion and Christianity in general. We're not that. We're this. Just push that a bit. I know it's Wednesday night. Just push that a bit. Jesus is here. He's here to receive your worship. He's here to receive your praise. He's here to hear your prayer. He's here to touch your life. He's here to heal somebody's sickness. I worship you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I give you praise. I give you praise. I worship you, Jesus. Just keep doing that. I think that's wonderful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By the time you get to the New Testament, James says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. An effectual and fervent prayer makes much power available. I'm talking to a group of people that have way more to pray about than Hannah did. They have way more reason to worship than Hannah did. They have way more reason to pray than Hannah did. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. Paul in Romans, he said, likewise also the Spirit helps our infirmities. We don't even know sometimes what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. 
So when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you've got a secret weapon that Hannah didn't have. You've got a secret tap in to the spirit realm that nobody in the Old Testament had. And if you would just utilize it, that would be incredible. If you would just utilize it, God would touch down in your life, even in a Wednesday night Bible study. So one more time, if you just lift up your hands and your voice, I'm not trying to get just a cheap emotional response out of you. What I'm trying to do is to get you to realize that you have power in prayer if you'll just use it. You have power in prayer if you'll just access it. You have that kind of power in prayer. And when you lift up your hands and your voice and you begin to pray in tongues, that's what Paul is talking about. You're praying in Morris code. The devil can't break it. Hell can't infringe on it. They can't hack your prayer. Your praying in a spirit language that goes straight to the throne of God. Somebody lift up a prayer in this room. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. I worship you, Jesus. Now, Hannah prays in the very best possible way way. Despite the emotional state she's in, she does something that is so awesome. The Bible says she simply pours out her soul before the Lord. Prayer is not a technique that we need to master. Prayer is simply telling God what is in your heart. One of the main reasons we don't pray more is that we don't feel the need to pray. When we think we can manage without God, our prayers end up being a duty that we do every day, a duty to perform, or maybe just an option in an already busy day that can easily get left out. Sometimes, precisely because we face bad situations, a bad situation can put us in a very good place to pray effectively. That's what happened to Hannah. Now, the main image Jesus gives us in the Word of God for prayer is of a little child asking their father for help. How many parents do I have in the room tonight? Children do not ask for things in a quiet, meditative, contemplative manner. Children insist and they shout and they clamor, and they persist until they get what they need. And that's what Jesus compared prayer to. The cry of a child is literally the cry of faith because a child believes that someone is going to hear them and respond, and that's why they cry out. So the cry of prayer is also the cry of faith. So what creates a great prayer life? What creates great praying in our lives? It's two things. Number one, a great sense of our frailty, that we can't do this on our own. And number two, a great sense of God's faithfulness, that he's going to hear us every time we pray. Now, you got to notice this. Hannah's situation has not changed, not at all. And yet, she's pouring out her soul to the Lord. She doesn't know how God is going to answer her prayer. But she leaves that place of prayer with a holy confidence that God will answer her prayer. In Philippians, Paul writes these words, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Can I take away a little guilt from somebody? It is not wrong to ask God for stuff. It is not wrong to pray and say, God, I need this. That's part of what prayer is for. It's not all of prayer, but don't ever let anybody make you feel selfish because you ask God for something. But here's where you've got to get to in prayer because you will ask God for things and he'll do what he did with Hannah. He doesn't answer you immediately. You don't get up from your knees. You don't walk out of service with your answer immediately in your hand. And that's where you got to kick in the next verse. And the peace of God, 
which passes all understanding, it will keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. In other words, I prayed, I gave it to God. I'm frail, but he's faithful, and now I'm going to leave it with him, and I'm going to stop fretting and stop worrying and stop having panic attacks, and I'm just going to stop doing all that and let the peace of God that passes all understanding. Do I have an answer yet? No. Do I have my miracle yet? No. Have I seen that person come back to God yet? No. Have I seen God intervene in my family, my finances, my job, whatever situation? No, but here's what I've got. I went to prayer, I took it to God, and when I walk out of God's presence, so help me, God, I'm gonna walk out with the peace of God that passes all understanding. Everybody else will look at me and say, but you're still sick, but your family's still messed up, but your finances are still bad. They'll look at me and they'll give me all of the facts. I've got one thing that is greater than facts, and that is my faith in a faithful God. God. So I can walk out of a prayer meeting where I poured out my soul to God and I can say, I have a peace that I don't understand and you won't understand, but it passes all understanding and it's keeping my heart and it's keeping my mind. Oh my goodness, we need that when we go to prayer. We need that as we live for God. We need that every day. I don't know what situation it is that you've been laying before the Lord over and over. Keep doing that. That's good. That's part of pouring out your soul. But don't get up from prayer and then go worry about it. Don't get up from prayer and then go get all frustrated about it. Leave it with God and let the peace of the Holy Ghost flood through your life and your mind and your heart and your day and just leave it with Jesus. Somebody, that's what you need to do. So I, I'm not trying to plague you with, with a bunch of response tonight, but we need to respond to the word of God. This isn't history. This is preached history. They're writing this so we'll get the point. And the point is when you get up from praying after you've poured out your heart and you're grief stricken, walk away like Hannah did and just walk away and go eat and go rejoice and go enjoy life and leave it with Jesus. So can I get this great congregation to lift up your hand again and somebody, while everybody else is just kind of doing uh, just the average praise, I want you to leave your situation with Jesus. You already prayed about it today, so leave it with Jesus and let his peace come on you. You already gave it to him last night or this morning or this afternoon, so just leave it with him. God's in charge and God is faithful. Hallelujah. I worship you, Jesus. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. That's what we do. That's how prayer works. We got to push that one a little bit. Somebody, literally, that's what you're doing. Unload all that stuff. You've been carrying it long enough. Let Jesus carry it for a while. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. The Holy Ghost just kind of confirmed that. So, so one more time, I'm sorry, but one more time, lift up your hands in this room. Somebody lay your care on him. Somebody lay your problem at his feet. Somebody give all your worry and all your fretting. Just put it on Jesus and let the peace of the Holy Ghost rush into your life right now. You can't fix it. If you could have, you already would have. But Jesus can fix it. So when you prayed, leave it with him. And live a life of victory. Live a life of joy. Live a life where the peace of God covers your heart and mind. I worship you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, God. Every once in a while, one of those special situations happens. And they rose up early in the morning and they worshiped before the Lord, Hannah included. And they returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. That's a Hebrew euphemism in the Old Testament for the intimate relationship between a husband and wife. And the Lord remembered her. Now that doesn't mean that God had physically, mentally forgotten her. It means that God saw her prayer and when the Bible says God remembered, it means he acted in accordance with his covenant. 
Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. So she gives him a very significant name and she says, his name means because I have asked him of the Lord. Now the Hebrew word sa'al, it means ask. And the Hebrew word sama means heard. And El, as you know, is one of the names for God. So when you put those together, Samuel means heard of God or asked of God. And names in the scripture are prophetic. All his life, Samuel was both an answer to his mother's prayer and he was a great man of prayer. And really he was the answer to Israel's prayer. He was a bridge builder between the period of the judges and the period of the kings. He was literally the margin between the judges and the kings. It was a critical time when Israel desperately needed direction. He was the last of the judges. He was the first of the prophets. He was the margin between the two. Samuel would later go on to establish a school of the prophets And of course, he was the one who anointed Israel's first two kings, Saul and David. So at a time when everything around was shaking, it was Samuel who brought spiritual stability to Israel. God did something, my goodness, God did something far greater than Hannah could have ever imagined through the prayer she prayed in her hour of desperation. She thought that if God answered her prayer, her greatest dream would be to have a little baby boy that she could return to the Lord. She had no idea that her prayer in her hour of desperation actually ushered in the next great era of Israel's history. She had no idea. Now the Hebrew word Saal is even closer to another Hebrew name. It's similar to Samuel, but Saal is very close to the Hebrew name Saul. And Saul will be the king, the first king that Samuel will eventually anoint. And again, because that name means asked for, Saul will be anointed king because the people have asked for him. The difference is that Hannah asked for her son so that she could give him to God. But Israel asked for a king just so they could be like the pagan nations around them. Which brings us to this point, that just because God allows you to have something does not necessarily mean it's a blessing in your life. James said it this way. He said, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Your asking is off target. It's off target because you're only asking so you can consume that thing upon your lusts. And then he hammers down with this very brutal statement. He says, you adulterers. And adulteresses, don't you know that the friendship of the world is an enemy, it's enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, they're literally the enemy of God. Now he puts that in the context of our asking in prayer. Be very careful because only God and you know your motives. And if you're asking for something that allows you to function in a fleshly, carnal, worldly way, you're asking amiss, and that puts you on the wrong side of God's plan. Hannah was not doing that. Hannah was asking so that when she got her request, she could honor God with her request. The story carries on in verse 21, and the man Elkanah and all his house, this is another year now, they went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up, I won't make the the journey to Shiloh until the child be weaned and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said unto her, do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. Meaning, I'm praying that God helps you keep your promise. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him And when she had weaned him, she took him 
up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. So uh, after a few years, we don't know exactly how many, she brought her little boy Samuel to the house of the Lord and the child was young. That's all we know. We don't know what age. And they slew a bullock, the proper sacrifice, and they brought the child to, en- to Eli. Now Hannah was a woman of prayer and during those years, there's no doubt that a woman of prayer like that taught that young boy, Samuel, to pray. One of the greatest things that we can do as parents is make sure our children know how to pray. The story thus far makes it very clear that the life of the nation, Israel, depends on the character of the home, Elkanah's home. And the character of the home depends almost entirely upon the spiritual life of the parents. And I would say the same thing to us. The future of our nation depends on the moral fiber of our homes. And the moral fiber of our homes literally depends on the spiritual life of the parents. Although they did not realize it, the future of the people of Israel rested in the hands of a young boy who was learning to serve the Lord and learning to pray. Just a little guy. Never underestimate the power of the Christian home. Never underestimate the power of a little child's dedication to God. They're everywhere around our church. They're noisy and loud. They can be a little destructive sometimes. They can be distracting sometimes. But they're here, and we love that they're here. And we don't just put up with the fact that they're here. We love that our children are in the house of God with us. They are not only welcome here, they are cherished here. Because we never know when the future of the great work of God might rest in the heart or the mind or the vision or the passion or the talent of a little guy or girl that's only this high. And we have an incredible contingent of teachers here and workers that minister to our kids. And sometimes they're out of sight, out of mind because they're not in the sanctuary on Sunday. But I thank God for each one of them because some of the people that stand on this platform every week now and minister to us, they were children in our Sunday school. And I thank God for the power of teaching and training in the life of children. Never underestimate that. Andy Stanley, a Baptist pastor from Atlanta, Georgia, one of the favorite quotes that I've ever come across of his is this one. Your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. I thank God that my kids love God and serve God and they're working for God. I thank God for that. I I wish you'd pray again. This is a Bible study. This isn't history. This is preached history. We're going to be in and out of prayer probably until we end tonight. But I wish you'd lift up your hands and if your kids are serving God, I wish you'd thank God for that. And if your kids are not right now serving God, I wish you'd pray one more time. The devil's not expecting an extra prayer in the middle of the lesson tonight, but lift up a prayer for your kids, your grandkids, whoever it is. Because our greatest contribution to God's kingdom might not be whatever ability or talent you have. It might be one of your kids that you're teaching or training. It might be one of your grandkids that you're right now praying for and God can use their life. God, I pray for the little babies in arms that are around our church. I pray for the little toddlers who have just learned to walk and run. And I pray for our children that are learning in Sunday school and they're learning tonight.
I pray, God, for our teenagers. Jesus, the people we're raising to know you and serve you, they may do something that we can't even begin to imagine. And so, God, we pray for them, and we affirm them, and we love them. We teach them, and we embrace them. They're from a different generation, but we love them fiercely, and we protect them fiercely. God, use their lives. Use the next generation of apostolics to shake this city and shake our world. God, it doesn't have to be us if you'll just let us raise them and teach them and train them. We won't be jealous. We'll be happy. We'll be thrilled. We'll be honored. God, use our kids and our grandkids for your kingdom and for your name's sake. Oh my goodness, there's a spirit of prayer in this room tonight. Yes, Jesus. I worship you, 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 Jesus. Uh, Hannah's so happy, she can't help herself. She reminds Eli, that old priest, he's still there. She reminds him, Oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed And the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked from him. Therefore also, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. That impacted that old priest of the Lord. See, the next time Hannah returns to Shiloh, she has her miracle son with her. For this child I prayed, therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As a pastor, I have to tell you that many parents today lend their children to education and to sports, to business, to travel, to many other things and activities. And they think when they get through with this phase of life, when they get through with their education, when they get through with their degree, then they will serve the Lord I've got to tell you that that almost never works out. Before we lend our children to anything else, we must lend them to the Lord, to his church, and to his work. If your children are successful in everything else except serving God, that's not a success. Elkanah and Hannah were literally, willingly, giving up their child for the rest of his life to God's service, and yet they were overjoyed to return Samuel to the Lord. Her prayer in the next chapter, which we will end with tonight, is one of rejoicing. And yet it is not the typical prayer of the mother of a new child. Rather, it is a prophetic prayer. An anointing like she's never felt comes on Hannah. And she says things that she probably didn't even understand. You see, Hannah's story is a picture of Israel's story. And by implication, it's a picture of humanity's story. Because like Hannah, we are barren. But thank God, he still brings life where there is no life. He still brings joy where there is no joy. He still brings salvation where there's only been destruction. And so right there at the temple in Shiloh, Hannah begins to pray. And she lifts up her voice and she says, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. In Scripture, everywhere in Scripture, a horn is symbolic of strength. 
Horns are the chief source of attack and defense in any animals that have them. Imagine Hannah's prayer image here. Imagine a rhinoceros with that huge horn goring its enemy and then lifting high its bloodied horn as a sign of victory. That's the image of Hannah's prayer. There were even horns on the tabernacle furniture. That's where you get the phrase holding on to the horns of the altar. So when Hannah says, mine horn is exalted, it's not herself she's exalting, it's her God. She's exalting. This prayer that she's praying right now is a victorious prayer of reversals. Everything in her life has now turned around. Her heart was sad. Now it's rejoicing. She was provoked by her adversary, but now her mouth is enlarged. That's a weird phrase. It means my mouth is wide in a grin of triumph over my enemies. And she gives all the praise to the Lord when she says, neither is there any rock like our God. The word rock is one of the most repeated images of the Lord found anywhere in the scriptures. It speaks of God's strength and his stability and his steadfastness. So when you say God is my rock, you're magnifying the fact that come hell or high water, your God never flinches, he never budges, and he never changes. Not in his character, not in his majesty, not in his power. So no wonder we say God is my rock and he's worthy of praise. Whew. Oh my goodness. I I'm sorry. You got to lift your hands on that one. God is worthy of praise because you might change and I might change and circumstances might change. But our God never changes. Blessed be our rock. Blessed be the God of our salvation. Hallelujah. 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 I worship you, Jesus. I give you praise. You never change. You never falter. You never fail. Ha ha ha. Yes, Jesus. Sunday, Lord, do la God, my rock. God, our rock. God, the rock. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Reboroto la calle masa. Ha ha. Ho. Uh, sorry, I'm stuck. I, I, I just can't. Let, we'll just, just one more. Just one more time. If you could get a picture of the fact that your circumstance may have changed, but your God hasn't changed. Your finances might have changed, but your God hasn't changed. Some family member might have changed in their attitude toward you, but your God hasn't changed. The report from the doctor might have changed, but your God hasn't changed. He's God, our rock. There is no rock like our God. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, God. I love you, Jesus. I don't have time tonight, but you can do this on your own. Hannah's prayer here at the beginning of 1 Samuel in chapter 2 echoes David's prayer at the far end of the books of Samuel in the end of 2 Samuel. Look it up. It's in the last couple of chapters. Hannah's prayer here is very similar to King David's prayer at the end of his life at the, book of, at the end of 2 Samuel. It's like they are spiritual prophetic bookends saying that no matter what happens in the history of the nation of Israel, their God is not changing. He's not in trouble. He's not surprised. You can't do a, a hostile takeover on heaven because God is a rock. Hannah continues in her prayer. She says, talk no more so exceeding proudly. She's talking to her enemies now. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. I got to stop right there and say, sometimes, you know what? We don't pray to the devil. That would be really stupid. But sometimes when you're praying to God, you can address the devil and you can rebuke the devil and you can command the devil to get out of your face and your space and your place and just say, out. Because you're praying to the God 
who created Lucifer. And so that was when Lucifer was the archangel of heaven. He was still far less than God. Now he's a fallen angel. So he's way less than God. And every once in a while, you, you've heard us when we pray here in church, every once in a while, we'll take authority over the kingdom of the devil. That's what Hannah's doing. She's taking authority over her enemies. Don't you talk exceeding proudly. Don't let arrogancy come out of your mouth because my God, he's a God of knowledge. He knows everything and by him actions are weighed. He knows the right from the wrong, the end from the beginning. The bows of the mighty men are broken. Their weapons are all shattered. They that stumbled are girded with strength. So, so you got to get this picture. It's reversal. Her prayer is a prayer of reversal. The people that we thought were going to have victory, they don't have victory any longer. And the people we thought were defeated, they now have that victory. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread. They that were hungry ceased so that the barren has borne seven children and she that hath many children is now waxed feeble. So this is her prayer. She She's so excited about the answer she got from God and prophecy comes on her and she starts to pray this prayer of reversals. But it's not just about her and her life and her situation. It has much more to do with the nation of Israel than just with Hannah and Penina. She's not just talking about Elkanah's other wife that had more children. You can see it. This isn't the normal prayer of a mother that has a, a young toddler and she's grateful for it. That's not a normal prayer prayer for a mother like that. This is a prophetic prayer. She's praying and in the spirit she says, there's no place for arrogance, enemies. When you stand before our God, he knows all things. He knows not just the actions of a life, he knows the motives of a heart. And just like Hannah, any of us might be misunderstood or we might be blind or misused by people, but our God will defend us. God can turn everything around. Look at her prayer. Warriors fall and their weapons are shattered while weaklings win the battle. The rich are out looking for bread while the poor have way more than they need. And the barren woman is blessed with children and the one who used to have all the children, she's grown so feeble, she can't even enjoy her own family. And by the way, if you read down to verse 21, which we'll do later, Hannah had five more children after Samuel. So God completely reversed her situation. She continues her prayer. This is not the prayer of a tender little, feeble little, weaker vessel, fragile woman. This is a prayer of a woman who is anointed and has great confidence in God. She says in her prayer, the Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and he bringeth up. See, the grave's not even the end with our God. The Lord makes poor and he makes rich. He brings low and he lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and he lifts up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among the princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. Because... The pillars of the earth, everything that supports human existence, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. Because he is sovereign, Hannah's God, our God, is in charge of life and death and everything in between. He controls every aspect of our existence because he's the Lord of all creation. At creation, God reversed everything. He turned darkness into into light. He turned emptiness into fullness. He turned chaos into order. And God can still do the very same thing for each and every situation in this room. See, the devil has some power on this earth, but the God you've been worshiping over the last few minutes, that God has all power on this earth. So the devil is no match for our God. (laughs) My goodness. Now, this part of Hannah's prayer is really the key to the book of Samuel. We'll find that out as we continue our study. She prophesies exactly what is going to happen in the lives of Israel's first two kings. It is not human power that's going to win the day and prevail. It is divine power that's going to win the day and prevail. That's what she's prophesying. When we first meet them, Israel's first king, Saul, when we first see him, the remark will be, he's head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. When we first meet David, Israel's second king, the remark will be made that he is the smallest and the youngest among all of his brothers. 
So literally, the first time we meet Saul, he's tall. The first time we meet David, he's small. And you watch how God takes that. And he brings Saul down and he lifts David up. And that's what Hannah's prophesying. Her prayer here is a prophecy. It's really outlining the whole point of the books of Samuel that God is really in control. I think that might be a word for us today when we get all worried about who's in power and who's in government and what's going to happen in politics and what's going to happen in the world and what's going to happen in nations. It's God that takes down kings. It's God that sets up kings. God holds sway over all the kingdoms of the world. And she keeps praying, and this part I really like. Not only does God do that to the politics of the world, but he will keep the feet of his saints. You're sure-footed when you're walking with Jesus. He keeps the feet of his saints. And the wicked shall be silent in darkness. They'll have nothing to say. For by strength shall no man prevail. It's not the strongest who win. It's those who are faithful to God who win. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, notice, and exalt the horn of his anointed. Notice that too. When Hannah says, God will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed, That's a remarkable prophetic statement. She's reaching now way out beyond the books of Samuel. Because at this point in history, here's why it's a remarkable statement. She says, God's going to give strength to his king. When she prays this prayer, there never has been a king. And currently there is no king in Israel. And nobody has yet asked for a king. So she's really into this spirit of prophecy. She said, God's going to give strength to his king. What she's saying is, God's king, God's man, God's leader is coming. And when he comes, he's going to turn this world upside down. Now, certainly the Lord gave strength to King David to do exactly that in Israel. And he fulfilled part of that prophecy. But only part of that prophecy. The ultimate fulfillment of Hannah's prophetic prayer is found in Jesus Christ, the ultimate Messiah, the ultimate anointed one, who one day will actually sit on David's throne and rule over his glorious kingdom. It's exactly what the angel Gabriel would later say to Mary. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Hannah prophesied that centuries before and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. But here's the difference between David and Jesus and of his kingdom there shall be no end. David's dead, buried and his bones turned to dust. Peter referred to it on the day of Pentecost. But Jesus is still living. He's still alive. He's still active and best of all, he's here tonight to receive the worship and the prayer and the praise of his people, of his kingdom. There shall be no end. One of the reasons Hannah could have faith for her miracle child is because in scripture, think about this, her experience of being barren was not new. This wasn't the first time. Hannah was not the first barren woman in the Bible to receive a child. In fact, if you read your Bible, each of the patriarchs of Israel had a barren wife, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Rachel. All of the patriarchs of Israel had a barren wife. And the parallels don't even end with the patriarchs. Because if you read a little further in the scripture, there are only three lifelong Nazarites in scripture. Samuel, who's just been born to Hannah, Samson, the great strong man, and John the Baptist. And each one of those lifelong Nazarites, the only three in the Bible, they were each born to a woman who was previously barren. So if Elizabeth is the mother of John the Baptist, if Elizabeth is the New Testament version of Hannah, then John the Baptist must be the New Testament version of Samuel. And sure enough, Just as Samuel is preparing the way for King David, someday John the Baptist, another Nazarite, 
the son of another previously barren woman, he will prepare the way, not for King David, but for King Jesus. You read it in the Gospel of Luke. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water. My goodness, I feel the Holy Ghost in this Bible study. But one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to bend down and unloose. He's going to do something greater than any prophet could ever do for you. He's going to do something greater than any human king could do for you. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, we talk a lot about the Holy Ghost. Let me talk about the fire. Every time God gave his people a new covenant, fire was involved. Fire ringed the mountain of Sinai when God gave the law. So when God poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost in the upper room, that's why in that initial outpouring, there were tongues of fire. It was more than just the precedent of the Holy Ghost. God was saying with that manifestation of tongues of fire, this is a brand brand new covenant. This is greater than the Old Testament. So my goodness, if people like Hannah, who never had the Holy Ghost, if they can have courage in God, and if they can pray bold prayers, and if they can have peace in the middle of disappointments and trials and opposition from the enemies, and if they can pray prayers that shake nations, surely people in the New Testament like us that are filled with the Holy Ghost, we can have confidence in God, and we can have peace in the middle of the storm, and we can and pray prayers that shake nations. That's just logical. All the way through Scripture, God gives children to barren women all the way through Scripture. Why? <laughs> Why? To show that salvation will be accomplished only through His power. But when it comes to the ultimate king, the supreme anointed one, the real Messiah, the real Christ, the ultimate fulfillment, the King of kings and Lord of lords. God does an even greater miracle than giving a child to a barren woman. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name more than just the title Christ or Messiah. They shall call his name Emmanuel. Remember Samuel? Asked of God or heard of God. El is a name of God. Well, when Jesus was called Emmanuel, El is still a name of God. That being interpreted is God with us. And I would go one further and say, subsequent to the day of Pentecost, it's not just God with us anymore. It's God in us. And we end here tonight, and we'll pick it up next time. And Elkanah went to, Ra went to Ramah to his house. They left that powerful prayer meeting in Shiloh. And the child did minister unto the Lord. They left little Samuel there. He ministered unto the Lord before Eli the priest. They literally gave God their very best. And I would say that giving God your very best is always 100% of the time worth it. Now, folks, I'm just telling you, I hope you've enjoyed the Bible study tonight. But there has been this undergirding of Holy Ghost prayer in this room tonight. And so I'd like you to stand right now all over this building and please do not disconnect and get ready to leave. Uh, pastors finished a little bit early tonight and that's on purpose. I would like you to just one more time lift up your hands and begin to pray. I don't know if God wants to heal somebody, if he wants to deliver somebody from fear, if he wants to speak to us through the gifts of the Spirit, if he wants to do some miracle for somebody. I just know that God doesn't tease his people. He didn't come and tease us with our emotions. He came here and there's a spirit of prayer here because God wants to do something for somebody here in Bible study tonight. So I wish you'd lift up your hands and make this your ultimate prayer. Make this your best prayer. Make this your, your ultimate reaching out to God tonight. We've heard the word of God. God's spoken to us and God wants to deliver somebody like he delivered Hannah. God wants to touch somebody and give them peace like he touched Hannah and gave her peace. God wants to provide somebody's miracle 
miracle like he provided that miracle boy for Hannah. God wants to pray some bold prayers through somebody like he prayed that prophetic bold prayer through Hannah. Let that out, let that out. Let that spirit of prayer, let it rise. Let it out, let it out through your voice. Be like Hannah. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if somebody else thinks you're acting weird. Let that prayer out. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man makes much power available. Monday, la herria so sabarito lo coya ba. Le monyo to la baya sa, rabaya sa. Mando lo corre he. If you're joining us by video or on the web, I want you to pray with us right now. In Jesus' name, just reach out to God and pray. God can touch you if you're watching this six months later. Lendo, let's yes, saba. Rico la herria he sa. Lendo lo de la baya sa, telaboche sa. God hear our prayer. God hear our cry. God hear your people. Arabo, ya sate la her, ya te la bosa. Sondo la bale da la bassa. Sondo lo to la he sa. There is no god like our god. There is no rock like our rock. Let the hayas yo saba. Lendo la de la bohor, ya te la bosse sa. Indo lo ko ye sia saba. Itola bahri ke rotoko ya basa. Rotoloho ya saba yo ko ye sa saba. Le boloto la bay eso saba rieko ya bati la bosiosa. Soto rebahisa. Suta la bahaya soto la kaya. Le boloto la bay ense ande yo to loko ya baha. Mendo na bati la bashasaba.